أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم know that these people are the Ahlul Kitab who give you halal food, but they know that on the same exact place, they cut pork and they mix pork and not sure if they take away that glove or not sure if they wash that knife and they give you the same food. How can you guarantee that something is halal? And let's look at the statement of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding that. Leave that which causes doubt towards which does not give you any doubt. So can there be a doubt in McDonald's when they give you halal? I want to hear you. Can there be doubt in McDonald's when they give you halal? Then how in the world can we say that they are giving me halal food? Let's look at the statement of Imam Shafi rahimahullah. What did he say about this? I'm a Hanafi, but I'm quoting Imam Shafi rahimahullah. إِذَا حَارَ أَمْرُكَ فِي مَعْنَيْنِ When you are caught in a difference of opinion, in two ma'nain, in two affairs. وَلَمْ تَدْرِي فِي مَا الْخَطَأْ وَالصَّوَابِ And you do not know what is mistake, and you do not know what is correct. فَخَالِفْ هَوَاكَ Then go against your desires. فَإِنَّ الْهَوَا يَقُودُ النُّفُوسَ إِلَى مَا يُعَابُ Because verily, your desires will lead you to do something that is haram and that is faulty. The translation. If you are caught in confusion between two matters and you really do not know what is right and what is wrong, at that point, disobey your desires for indeed desires will only lead to what is blameworthy and wrong. So you automatically understand that in the case of Dunkin' Donuts, the morning wraps, the wake-up wraps, if you know, disclaimer, if you know there is a brother who personally works there and he washes the, uh, the tools and everything for you, then inshallah you can probably rely on that brother, probably. But most cases, most of us, as Muslims, we do not check. We do not even check if the brother washed his knife, the same knife he used to cut pork or bacon strips, the same knife he used to give chicken or beef to someone else. And we do not care about that. My dear brothers, even a small contamination will cause haram, as we have seen. Any contamination of haram turns something into haram. Moving in forward, the outcome, on the day of judgment, you know what will happen? Do not laugh at the, uh, at the upcoming picture. You know what will happen? They'll be fighting before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ronald McDonald will be fighting with Colonel Sanders. And the last thing you want will be to be amongst them in that fight. Do you guys want to be amongst them? Do you want to be just for a one Big Mac you want to be before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The consequence of that? You versus Allah. For those of you who have the audacity or the guts to go against Allah on the day of judgment, that's up to you. But I myself cannot do that. The Qur'an gives us ayahs and the references. Due to my timing being short, I will cut it completely. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us complete elaboration. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمُ Surah Al-Baqarah 168 يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ Surah Ma'idha حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ Surah Ma'idha again يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْدَّمُ وَالْأَنصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ And moving on forward, Surah Baqarah again. Keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are mustaghni. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is independent from us. But we cannot move an inch without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep in mind my dear brothers, it might taste good. It might give you a comfort for a single minute. But on the day of judgment, that will come back to bite you in such a way that you have no idea about. Just because you do not see it, just because you do not conceive it, just because you do not comprehend to it, does not mean it's running away. Just because in this world, the karma did not come back to you, I guarantee you on the day of judgment, the karma will be in such a manner that you will have no reply to it. The divine inspiration that we can use, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you are young, Allah will remember you when you are old. If you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are healthy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember you when you are sick. If you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are free, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember you when you are busy. If you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life, Allah will remember you in your death. Keep that in mind. Contentment, keeping in mind this will not give you contentment, it will give you comfort. And the true contentment comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'in al Verily, with the remembrance of Allah, does your heart find contentment. Valuing the order of Allah, as I said, Imam ibn Qudama rahimahullah said, it is the signs of the end of time when the people start to value the eyes of the public more than they value the eyes of Allah. Where we start, just because uncle will see me, or just because Mufti Farhan will see me, I will not sin in front of him, but as soon as I'm away from Mufti Farhan, I am committing sin. And I consider Mufti Farhan's eyes more than the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the status of us Muslims right now. Change that. Remember to value the eyes of Allah more than you value the eyes of your parents even. The value of rarity. We know gold, diamonds, any raw materials that is valuable in this world. Do you find them in abundance or small numbers? Tell me, 
Any valuable item in this world, do you, fi do you find them in abundance or you find them in small numbers? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this insti instinctive value within us that anything that's rare, it's valuable. So halal, if it's rare, know that it is valuable. Valuing yourself. All of this is not going to help Allah, is not going to help Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's not going to help your parents, it's not going to help anyone except yourself. This investment is for yourself. And they say health is the best investment, well let's think about the health in the day of judgment. Intelligence over influence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I will finish off with this inshallah. The kuffars and the non-Muslims knew Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a word. And he was known as Wakana ahlam an nas. He was ahlam is in the term of akbar. Comparatively more intellectual of mankind. And the kuffars used to say, Kana yusaffihu ahlamana. He used to erase our intelligence. Ha la mim, hilmun, has another meaning towards it, which means forbearance, patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the term forbearance for himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in many, in many places in the Quran that Allah is halim, Allah is halim, Allah is forbearance, Allah bears your burden. However, in order to understand the similarities between these two words and why was intelligence used for forbearance as well? Because when something is empty, do I have a cup over here? Can I, can I borrow? Forgive my forgive my, forgive my manners. We have an empty bottle over here. This is us. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us intelligence, He fills us. And since it has water, will you be able to, once you have no water inside, will it be flimsy? When there's nothing inside, will it be flimsy? But if there is something inside, what will happen? It will become strong. Its fundamentals will become strong. The foundation will become more firm. It will not be phased easily. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given hilm, intelligence because he was not to be phased in great defeat and in great uh, uh, loss, in great victory. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, circumstances changed. He was a poor man. He was a sire. He was a statesman. He was a soldier. And he became a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In all cases, circumstances, situations changed. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remained the same. And that is what we are to look at. And if you know in Surah Yusuf, Qalu Adghathu Ahlam, Ahlam is also used for dreams and also, also we know the woman's breast area the specific area is called the halama and the when a child is moving around and it's moving uncontrollably and the mother starts to suckle the child does this child become calm yes it becomes calm in the case of your dream when you are dreaming are you moving around or are you stationary you are stationary that is why they call it ahlam prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given intelligence and that intelligence made him strong in his foundation. And we are to take that intelligence from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the aspect of halal and haram. And we must understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. And the authority cannot be over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have any questions on the day of judgment regarding halal and haram, remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there who is going to question you. And you're not going to be able to question Allah. If you do have the guts to go against Allah, then go ahead and eat haram. But if you do so by mistake, Mistake, there's no khata upon you. It's just okay. It's not a sin. And for the brothers, in terms of halal and haram, when is truly haram halal upon you? Someone who is compelled to out of necessity, he's starving and he does not seek haram. Only for then and there he is allowed to eat haram. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to, to understand this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to be subconsciously aware of what is halal and eat from only halal and tayyibah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in true reality, our consumption of halal is a medium of getting closer to Allah. And our medium of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obeying the orders of Allah. And once we obey the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will place us in Jannah. That was quite weak. But subhanallah, subhanakallah, wa bihamdika, ashadu la inta saffiru ka atubi laik. Zakallah, khairan Shaykh Abdullah al-Kafi for that beautiful presentation. Brothers and elders and sisters in Islam, in reality, one of the greatest challenges as Shaykh was mentioning is what we eat, which has a great effect in our life, in our ibadah, and every aspect of our life itself. So whatever has been mentioned, may Allah allow us to understand and practice. <clears throat> There's going to be a switch of one program. The next program was supposed to, uh, the speech was supposed to be Mufti Abdul Rahman, but inshallah he's here with us. But alhamdulillah we are also blessed with the company of Brother Amjad Hussain. 
who is alhamdulillah one of the world most renowned uh, person to recite, recite nasheed and, and praise and the hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the praise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he's along with us he has to go to another program so he has to be with us inshallah now uh, as we know inshallah he will introduce himself as well and explain how Allah changed him he was uh, t- you know uh, at one of the top singers in Pakistan from which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to, to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and praise the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu So without a further ado, I request Badam Amjad Hussain sahib inshallah to come and enlighten us with his beautiful voice inshallah. Takbir! Takbir! Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Aziz ulama ikram, Mohtaram, بزرگو دوستو اور بھائی میری بہنوں السلام علیکم دوبارہ وعلیکم السلام میں یہاں پر جو پروگرام آپ ہمیشہ تقریبا ہر سال سے ہو رہا ہے اینڈ الحمدللہ میں ہر سال مجھے توفیق ہوتی ہے کہ میں اس مسجد میں اور ویسے بھی اس مسجد میں اتنی خوبصورتی ہے روحانیت ہے کہ دل کرتا ہے اور خاص طور پہ میں شکر گزار ہوں مفتی فرحان صاحب کا اور جناب اپنے پیارے بھائی سرفراز کا جن کی محبتوں سے میرا دل ابھی دستے میں ٹریفک جام دل کر رہا تھا جلدی جلدی پہنچے آج جس سلسلے میں یہ پروگرام کیا جا رہا ہے اس میں زیادہ تر میرے آڈینس جو ہیں وہ میرے یگسٹرز ہیں بیٹھے ہیں نا الحمد للہ کدھر بار تو نہیں کھیڑتے پہ تو ان شاء اللہ تعالیٰ وی نیڈ دیز ٹائپ آف دیز کائنڈ آف پروگرامس فار آر یوتھ الحمد and uh, it's a great blessing of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have uh, uh, alhamdulillah we have uh, scholars we have ulama deen with us to teach us so we should get uh, more benefit as we can have from them alhamdulillah it's a great honor for us to have these ulama ikram with us allah keep their saya for a long long time jazakumullah khair I will start my performance inshallah with the hum <clears throat> karam kar karam kar hamare haal par e kari کرم کر ہمارے حال پر اے کری تیرا نام رہ کرم کر ہم سب کے حال پر اے کری خلق کے راندھے ہوئے دنیا کے ٹھکرائے ہوئے آئے ہیں اب تیرے در پر ہاتھ پھیلائے ہوئے یا اللہ یا کرم کر ہمارے حال پر اے کری خار ہے بدکار ہے ڈوبے ہوئے ذلت میں ہے بد 
मददगार हैं डूबे हुए जिल्लत में है कुछ भी है लेकिन तेरे महबूब की उम्मत में है या अल्लाह हो या रहमानो या करम कर हमारे हाल पर ए करीम ए करीम शुक्रिया अल्लाह ताला जिन लोगों ने इस प्रोग्राम को ऑर्गेनाइज किया है जिस भी हालत में अल्लाह ताला उसको उन लोगों को सब बहन भाइयों को अजर अजीम बता फरमाए जी ये मेरे दोस्तों की कौन सी फरमाइश है मस्जिद नबी ये तो बता बड़ी खूबसूरत जगह जो लोग हज पे गए हैं जो उम्र के लिए गए हैं उनको अंदाज़ा है कि वहाँ की कैफियत लफ्ज़ों में बयान करना मुश्किल है वो वही जाके पता चलता है जो लोग नहीं गए अल्लाह ताला उनको लेकर जाए सयामीन और जो लोग गए हैं अल्लाह उनको बार बार ले जाए बड़ी खूबसूरत मस्जिद उसके बारे में एक बड़े मोहब्बत करने वाले नबी से मोहब्बत करने वाले सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि सल्ला वसल्लम उन्होंने ख्याल किया कि जब मस्जिद नबी में आप सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम बैठे होते थे तो क्या तेरी कैफियत थी उस मौजू पे मैं चंद शार सुनाऊंगा मस्जिद नबी ये तो बता समा वो कैसा प्यारा होगा मस्जिद नबी ये तो बता समा वो कैसा प्यारा होगा सहन में आका बैठे होंगे गिरदस हाब का हल्का होगा मस्जिद नबी ये तो बता समा वो कैसा प्यारा होगा दो जग के सरदार की बातें दीनों दानिश की सौगाते उस महफिल में इन फूलों से हर कोई दामन भरता होगा उस महफिल में इन फूलों से हर कोई दामन भरता होगा इन जलवों के दिन भी तेरी याद का हिस्सा होंगे जिनमें हसन हुसैन का बचपन नाना की गोदी में खेला होगा हसन हुसैन का बचपन नाना की गोदी में खेला होगा बज में नबूवत में सुदीक भी फारू को मानो अली भी बज में नबूवत में सुदीक भी फारू को मानो अली भी चारों यार सितारे होंगे बीच में चांद चमकता होगा चारों यार सितारे होंगे बीच में चांद चमकता होगा अर्ज मदीना मांगे बिलाल से तेरी फजा जब गूंजती होगी उसके सुरूरो सोज की जद में हर कोई बह बह जाता होगा मस्जिद नबी ये तो बता 
समा वो कैसा प्यारा होगा सहन में आका बैठे होंगे गिरद साहब का हल्का होगा गिरद साहब का हल्का होगा शुक्रिया अब आखिर में चंद शार बार गाह रसालत कोशिश करूंगा मैं चंद शार पेश कर सकूं हजार बार बिशोयम धन से मुस्को गुलाब हनूज नामे तो गुफ्तन कमाल बी अदबी अस्त उस जात का नाम लेने से पहले हजार दफा शेख शादी फरमाते हैं जिसका मफहूम है इस मुंह को अंबर मुश्क गुलाब से धो फिर नाम लो हमारे आका जिनकी शफात के बगैर हमारा कोई भी मसला हल नहीं हो सकता अल्लाह ताला हमें उनके तरीकों पर अमल की तोफी कता फरमाए आमीन सलाम उस पर बलग लोला भी कमाल ही कश्यप दो जा भी जमाल ही हसनत जमी खिसाल ही सलूल वाल ही सलाम उस पर के जिसने बेकसों की दस्तगिरी की सलाम उस पर के जिसने बेकसों की दस्तगिरी की सलाम उस पर के जिसने बात शाही में फकीरी की सलाम उस पर के असरार मोहब्बत जिसने समझाए सलाम उस पर के जिसने जख्म खाकर फूल बरसाए सलाम उस पर के जिसने जख्म खाकर फूल बरसाए सलाम उस पर जो उम्मत के लिए रातों को रोता था सलाम उस पर सलाम उस पर जो फरशे खाक पे जाड़ों में सोता था सलाम उस पर के जिसने फजल के मोती बखेरे हैं सलाम उस पर सलाम उस पर बुरो को जिसने फरमाया ये मेरे हैं सलाम उस पर बुरो को जिसने फरमाया ये मेरे हैं सलाम उस पर जो उम्मत के लिए सब दुख उठाता था सलाम उस पर सलाम उस पर जो भूखा रह के और को खिलाता था सलाम उस पर के जिसके घर में चांदी थी न सोना था सलाम उस पर के टूटा बोरिया जिसका बिछोना था 
سلام اس پر کے جس نے بے کسوں کی دستگیری کی سلام اس پر کے جس نے بادشاہی میں فقیری کی شکریہ السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ Zaka Allah Khairan, Brother Amjur Hussain, for those who understood, we felt the depth of the words, and for those who couldn't understand the language, but yes, definitely there was something which penetrates the hearts, you know. So may Allah truly give us the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, and the way of the Prophet sallallahu within our lives. Alhamdulillah, our next speaker is Sheikh Mufti Abdul Rahman. Sheikh Mufti Abdul Rahman is from Detroit, Michigan. He's a graduate from Darulum, Ajax, Canada. After finishing his studies from there, Alhamdulillah, he pursued his ifta, which is a PhD in Islamic jurisprudence and, and, and Islamic fiqh. And he traveled to Pakistan in, in Jamiatul Ulum al Islamiyah, Binori town. And ever since that time, Alhamdulillah, now he's, he's serving his community in Detroit, Michigan. Alhamdulillah, we are honored for, uh, that he has, Alhamdulillah, bestowed us, that he has come to our, our, our gathering, inshaAllah, and we can benefit from his uh, presence. The topic that Muthi Abdul Rahman Sahib will be covering is known as the trial of wealth, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in detail in Surah Al-Kahf. So without a further ado, I request Mufti Abdul Rahman Sahib to come and enlighten us with his knowledge and his hikmah, insha'Allah. Takbir! Takbir! This is one uh, request, if the brothers can come closer, you see. If we sit together, the more we will benefit like that, inshallah. Please come closer. The brothers that have any back problems, no problem. You can lean on the wall. Jazakallah khair. Not everyone should come close because if all of us leave the wall, then the wall might break, you know? We need some people to keep the wall up. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي ابتعثنا لنخرج العباد من عبادة العباد إلى عبادة رب العباد ونخرجهم من ضيق الدنيا إلى سعتها ونخرجهم من جور الأديان إلى عدل, إلى عدل الإسلام ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واضرب لهم مثل الحياة الدنيا كما إن أنزلناه من السماء فاختلط به نبات الأرض فأصبح هشيما تذروه الرياح وكان الله على كل شيء مقتدرا وقال عز وجل في مقام آخر يا قوم إنما هذه الحياة الدنيا متاع وإن الآخرة هي دار القرار وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام بئس العبد عبد تجبر واعتدى ونسي الجبار الأعلى بئس العبد عبد عتا وتغى ونسي المبتدى والمنتهى بئس العبد عبد سها ولها ونسي المقابر والبلا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Honorable ulama kiram, my dear respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The topic in hand is a very difficult, tricky topic But to make sense of it all I will start by enlightening this gathering with an example Taqrib ilal faham, they say in Arabic by giving an example, we can probably draw some better conclusions. The world today that we're living in, and if we take a glimpse and we take a survey of every single person that's living in any continent, any city, any village in the world, we are all striving for one common thing. We are all striving for one common thing. 
But this one common thing, by different people it can be named different things. Someone can say this one common thing is this, and some other person can say this one common thing is that. It is like three people, someone gave one dollar, someone gave one dollar to three people. So the first person says, with this one dollar, I will buy grapes. What did he say? I will buy grapes. He speaks English and he speaks no other language. There was a person that spoke Urdu standing next to him. And he said, no, no, nay, nay. Main to is dollar ke saath angoor khridunga. What does he say? Main to is dollar ke saath angoor khridunga. So now the, Arab, the English guy is saying, no, I will buy grapes. And the Urdu guy is saying, angoor. And there's an Arab, Arab standing there. And he's saying, no, la, inni ashtaril inab. Inni ashtaril inab. Inab means grapes. He said, I'm going to buy inab. So now these three people are having a little conversation and a dispute. One guy walks by that knows all three languages. And he says, you know what, give me the dollar. He takes a dollar, he goes to a store next door, he buys a bunch of grapes, he comes back and he says to the person that speaks English, these are your grapes, to the person who speaks Urdu, ye tumare khajur hain, the person who speaks Arabic, hadha lakal inab. This is your inab, that's it. This is your inab, this is your khajur, this is your grapes. We have different ways of saying what we want. But if we look at it, we are all striving for one common thing, which is happiness. What do we want? Happiness. We all want happiness. Some people, a youngster will say, I want happiness. But in his words, he'll say, I want to go to college and get a good degree. An elderly person will say, I want happiness. But my happiness is that my son gets a good rishta. A mother will say, I want happiness. But her happiness will be, I, w- I wish my daughter gets a good rishta. Everyone has different ways of saying it, but everyone wants one common goal, which is happiness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the architect of this world and He's the architect of human beings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what will make this person happy. And Allah knows what will make him not happy. Allah knows what will depress him. And Allah knows what will make, bring joy to him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did He do? The story of these two gardeners, if we look at it, the, stor- the story of these two gardeners, I will mention in small detail. If we look at the story of these two gardeners, these two people are just two people in the Qur'an. But right now in this world, we can find millions of these two people. Just looking around us right now, we can find hundreds of these two people. One person, his name was Abu Salma ibn Abdul Asad. And the other person, his name was Al-Aswad bin Abdul Asad. Two brothers. One was Muslim and one was Kafir. They had, their father passed away and they both inherited one garden. The Muslim said, the Muslim, he sold his portion of the garden to his brother. And his brother gave him 4,000 dinar. How much dinar? I can't hear you. How many dinar? 4,000 dinar. So now the, sec- the brother has, the, the, the Kafir brother, he has two gardens and he has a surplus of 4,000 dinar. So what does he do? With 1,000 dinar, with 1,000 dinar, now he has extra money and this Muslim has extra, now he has also 4,000 dinar because he sold it. What does he do with 1,000 dinar? He buys one land. He buys one land. So the Muslim says, Ya Rabb, Allahumma inna ashtara fulan ibn fulan ardan فَإِنِّي أُرِيدُ أَنْ أَشْتَرِي مِنْكَ الْأَرْضِ فِي الْجَنَّةِ Oh Allah, so and so has bought a land in this world, but oh Allah, with this 1,000 dinar that he bought land in this world, in a, in a garden in this world, I wish to buy a garden in Jannat. He took those 1,000 dinar and he bought 100 slaves and he freed 100 slaves. Then that person, the kafir person, he took 1,000 dinar and then he gave this thousand dinar in meher to a woman. So what does this person say? He says, oh, Allahumma, oh my Rabb, this person, he, my brother over here, he took one thousand dinar and he gave it as a dowry for a wife in this world. Oh Allah, I will give one thousand dinar in charity today and you set me some women in Jannat for me, okay? That's what he did. So he only had four thousand dinar, two are gone. 
Now that, that person, he had one more thousand dinar. He buys slaves and workers that can work for him in the garden. What does this person do? He says, Oh Allah, he spent one thousand dinar in this world. Oh Allah, I will spend one thousand more dinar. And these one thousand dinar, I'll buy clothes. And from these clothes, I will give it to all those people that don't have clothes. Oh Allah, so you buy me some clothes in Jannah. Then this person buys a house in this world. Then he says, Oh Allah, this brother of mine bought a house in this world. Oh Allah, I am taking this 1000 dinar and I will put it in a place where they can, they can propagate the deen of Allah and build a masjid and build these things. Oh Allah, you buy me a house in Jannah. So when I come there, a house is waiting for me. So a house is waiting for me, a garden is waiting for me, my wives are waiting for me, and my servants are waiting for me in Jannah. So now after a little while, this person, the Muslim brother, Abu Salma, now he needs, he needs a job. Now he needs a job. And he has no money. So he goes back to his brother. He says, you know what, let me go ask my brother. If he can, I know, I know how to garden, I know how to work. Let me go back to my brother. Maybe my brother will help me out. Give me a job, I'll work for him. So he goes back to him. He said, what did you do with those 4,000 dinar I gave you? And he told him the whole story. That brother said to him, مَا أَظُنُّ أَن تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ أَبَدًا وَمَا أَظُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمًا وَلَئِنْ رُدِئْتُ إِلَىٰ رَبِّ لَأَجِدَنَّ خَيْرًا مِنْهَا مُنْقَلَبًا Oh you stupid fool! Do you really think Qiyamah will come? Do you really think there's Jannah and Jahannam? Do you really think there's Allah and who's controlling everything? You're such a fool that you don't deserve to work for me. You don't deserve to work for me. My dear respected brothers, this theme, this theme of Surah Kahf, and this portion, if we look around us today, we see it everywhere. Competition in the wrong thing. Once Hazrat Ali says, that if someone competes with you in deen, then go ahead, compete with him. But if someone's trying to compete with you in dunya, then you tell him, go ahead and do what you gotta do, I'll do what I have to do. Today, we have a wedding, we take a small little portion. We have a shadi. And we have our shadis and our weddings have become so complex, so complex, because we are competing with everyone around us. That what is my cousin gonna say? What is my brother gonna say? What is Khala gonna say? What's Mamu gonna say? And what is that person gonna say who doesn't even know me? Huh? We're thinking about everybody. So what do we have? We have so many, tak- I don't even know the names. First we have a Nikah Nama. And then we have something called uh, Ruksati. Then we have, some, before Ruksati we have Mandi. Then we have Ruksati. And then we have Bankruptcy. <laughs> this is what's going on. So when the husband finally meets his wife, when the husband finally meets his wife, after all those formalities we have put on the husband and wife, when they finally get together in the hotel or in the room, husband says, honey, I'm broke. <laughs> so much debt already. This just because we're competing with dunya. We're competing for more things in dunya. But the sahaba were not like this. The sahaba were not like this. Hazrat Umar and Hazrat Abu Bakr used to constantly compete for things of akhirat, constantly. To such an extent, once Hazrat Umar anhu, he, they used to go at night and look for people who are poor, who are in need, so they can help them. Once Hazrat Umar set out at night time in the Khilafat of Abu Bakr anhu, and he went and he saw that, hey, there's an old lady, this is an old lady living in this house, and she's blind and she has no children, let me go and take care of her. Let me go and take care of her. Once he got to her house, and as he entered into the house, he realized that this lady, everything's already cleaned. The bed is already made. The woman has already been fed. And everything has already been taken care of. So he was shocked. And he said, who came before me? Who could have thought about this before me? So he said, tomorrow I'm going to come early and see. Who is thinking about this before me? The next day he comes early. And he stands in the bushes nearby. And who does he see? He sees Abu Bakr anhu on his back. He has a lota and he's going to the house. And he says in his heart, I felt like jumping out and going to Abu Bakr and hugging him and telling him, Oh Abu Bakr, you're beating me in everything. Come on man, give me a break sometimes. But I didn't do it because I said, Hey, you know, he has ikhlas. He wanted to keep this between him and Allah. So I left him. The day Hazrat Abu Bakr passed away, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I said, now that lady must be alone. 
and no one will be taking care, taking care of her. So I decided I should go. At night time I went, and the lady was blind, so she did not realize the difference between me or Abu Bakr. I cleaned the house, you know, cleaned her clothes, took care of her necessities, and when it was food time, I put the food on the plate, and then I took a piece of meat, and I put, placed a piece of meat in her mouth. As I placed a piece of meat in her mouth, she said that the person that came yesterday was different than the person that came today. She realized. So he said, of course he couldn't lie. So he said, how do you know? How do you know that the person that came yesterday is different from the person that's today? So that woman said, the person who came yesterday, he knew that I'm an old lady and I have no teeth. So what he would do was he would take the rough meat and he would place it in his mouth and chew it till it would become soft. Then he would place the meat in my mouth and you place the meat directly in my mouth. My dear respected brothers, they competed for not dunya, they competed for akhirat. Because happiness is not something we can attain by getting more things. Happiness is not something we can attain by building more houses. Happiness is not something we can attain by getting bigger degrees. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, he was approached by Ibn Ziyad. And he was told, Ya Amir Mu'mineen, Qad tagayyirta, qad tagayyirta, بعد الملك that you have changed after you have become a king إذا كنت في مكة كنت في صحة وفي أمان وفي عافية when you were in مكة before you became Amir al-Mu'mineen you were a young handsome man who used to walk around lavishly arrogantly proudly with nice clothes with, with the luxury of this world and since you have become Amir al-Mu'mineen you have totally changed you know what he said to him he says يا ابن زياد لو رأيتني بعد ثلاثة أيام أو ابن زياد You know what you should do? You should see me three days after I die in my قبر يوم أجرد عن, ال... يوم أجرد عن اللباس وأوسد في التراب وأفارق السحاب You should come see me three days after I die And you, could, you should come see me when I'm in my grave Three days after I die and you should see that the clothes that were put on me, they will be torn off of me. And you should see that the pillow today is not no comfortable pillow, it's the pillow of the dirt. And you would see, you would see that today I have no friends and no family. يَسُؤُكَ O Ibn Ziyad, if you were to see me after three days, you would see such a scene that would really hurt your feelings. That would really hurt your feelings. This Umar bin Abdul Aziz, when he became Khalifa, one woman in her time. Look at this example and think how the people in the world at that time were happy, prosperous. How? What did they do? What did they do different from us? This one woman came from Samarkand and she came to the, to the, to the Darul Khilafah. And when she reached there, she asked, I want to meet Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar bin Abdul Aziz. So people told her, she came to the city. People told her, well, you know, Amr bin Abdul Aziz doesn't live in the city, he lives in the village. So she was shocked. Oh, the king of the Muslims doesn't live in the city, lives in the village? So she said, okay. With this feeling of being shocked, she walked towards the village. When she reached the village, she asked, where is the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar bin Abdul Aziz? Someone guided her towards a little hut close by. And they said, this is his house. She was even in more shock. She said, what? Amir al-Mu'mineen living in a hut? Well, I need something from him, so I'm going to go to him. She went and knocked on the door. And the door was open for her. When the door was open, what did she see? She sees a woman cooking roti, making roti bread with her own hands. So she gets shocked. She says, hey, I'm coming to meet the wife of Umar bin Abdul Aziz Amir al-Mu'mineen. So that lady sitting there making bread said, I am the wife. I am the wife. She got even more shocked. Fatima. Fatima, this woman who was the wife of Imam Aziz, she was the most royal woman to ever walk on the face of the earth. Because she received royalty through seven different lineages. Through seven different lineages. Her, her, from her father, her, his, her father was a king. And her father was a king. 
and then four of her brothers were a king and his, her husband was a king. Seven different lineages. So the woman is even more shocked. And she says, what? Well, okay, I came to meet you. And in this shock stage, she's talking to her. And she's saying, you know, I've come from so far. I have four daughters and my husband has passed away. And I need you to write me some, I need you to do some sifarish and intercession for me that your husband can write me some money so I can give it to the minister and this of my city and he can start giving it to me on a monthly basis. So as she's talking to her, at once she looks at a person standing nearby, patching some holes in the wall with some mud. You know what mud? Patching some holes in the wall with his own hands. And he, that man keeps on looking at this woman baking bread. So this woman who came from Samarkand, she says to that, so she says to that lady, she said, who is this guy? This worker is not a good worker. He keeps on looking at you. He keeps on looking at you. He doesn't have any modesty in his eyes. He keeps on looking at you. So that wife says, you know who that is? That's my husband. That's my husband, Amir Mu'mineen. Oh, what so much shock. She screamed. And she said, the world outside this house is living in so much prosperity, and so much happiness, and so much contentment. Why is the house of the king of the Muslims living in such miserable conditions, with such less sustenance? Why, cannot, why can't you live in more affluence? So you know what the wife said? Because we are living like this, that is the reason why everyone is living like that. Because we are living like this, that is the reason why everyone outside is living like that. It wasn't because of this, that they were happy. نَا كَهِينَ جَهَا مِنْ أَمَا مِلِي Allama Iqbal said it very nicely. نَا كَهِينَ جَهَا مِنْ أَمَا مِلِي جُو أَمَا مِلِي تو کہاں مِلِي مِرِ جُرْمِ خَانَئِ خَرَابِ کو تِرِ عَفْوِ بَنْدَ نَوَاز مِلِي The only place we can get contentment and the only place we can get happiness is straight from the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallam was not afraid. He says, مَا الْفَقْرَ أَخْشَى عَلَيْكُمْ I'm not afraid that this whole ummah will become poor and they will have no money. وَلَكِنْ أَخْشَى أَنْ تُبْسَطَ عَلَيْكُمَ الدُّنْيَا I am afraid that one day you will get so much wealth and so much dunya فَتَنَافَسُوهَا كَمَا تَنَافَسُوهَا Then you will start competing to get more and more and more and more فَتُهْلِكَكُمْ كَمَا أَهْلَكَتْهُمْ Then this competition for dunya and for wealth will destroy you like it destroyed the people of the past. And my brothers and sisters and elders, the Sahaba, they did not teach their kids these things. They did not get up in the morning and make dua, Oh Allah, make my son a doctor. Oh Allah, make my son an engineer. Oh Allah, give my son money. When they woke up in the morning, and when they went, slept at night in the evening, they used to make dua, Oh Allah, let, my, let not my son die in my house. Let him die in the path of Allah. You will see, look at Abdullah bin Zubair, a young man. On the day when he was about to become shaheed, this example is an example for the whole ummah. One young man who was brought up with the right mentality, with the sunnah, with the deen of Allah. How does this one youngster become such a big, how does he become such a giant? Abdullah bin Zubair, as he was walking out, Hajjaj bin Yusuf has already decreed, when I come there, be ready, Abdullah bin Zubair is going to get shaheed. So Abdullah bin Zubair is walking outside of his house. As he's walking outside, his mother Asma, his mother Asma was 100 years old, and she was already blind. She was already blind, and there was no one else in the house. So Abdullah bin Zubair turns around, and he says to his mother, Ya Umma, kuni ala thiqatin. Oh my mother, you know what? I want to divulge a secret to you. I want to tell you a secret. You know, if we open the secret diaries of uh, youngsters today, all we will find is illicit relationships. Huh? That's all we will find. But this is the secret of Abdullah bin Zubair that he is disclosing to his mother. And he is saying, Kuni ala thiqatin. Oh my mother, you know I'm leaving today right now, but before I leave, I want to tell you a secret. What's that secret? Ya umma, annabnaki. لم يتعمد إتيان منكر قط وما عمل بفاحشة قط 
ولم يغدر في أمان قط ولم يتعمد ظلم مسلم ولا معاهد قط ولم يكن شيئا عنده آثر من رضا الله عز وجل قط ولا أقول ذلك تزكية لنفسي ولكن إنما قلته لأدخل العزاء على قلبك Those who understand Arabic can really appreciate these words of Abdullah bin Zubair. He says, oh my mother, before leaving today, I want to just tell you a secret. And the secret is, oh my mother, your son standing right in front of you today, you should be proud that this son has never intentionally committed a sin in his entire life. Your son standing in front of you today, oh my mother, has never thought, looked, walked, touched anything immodest. Never immodesty even came to him. وَلَمْ يَغْدُرْ فِي أَمَانٍ قَدْتُ O my mother, O my mother be proud, your son has never told a lie in his entire life. O my mother be proud, وَلَمْ يَتَعَمَّدْ ظُلْمَ مُسْلِمٍ وَلَا مُعَاهِدٍ قَدْتُ Your son standing in front of you today has never hurt the feelings of anybody, Muslim or non-Muslim. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ عِنْدَهُ آثَرْ مِنَ رَضَ اللَّهِ And O oh my mother, throughout your son's life, the most important thing was to make Allah happy and everything else was secondary. O oh my mother, I'm not saying this تَزْكِيَةً لِنَفْسِي to flatter myself so the whole world will know Abdullah bin Zubair was like this. وَلَكِنْ لِيُدْخِلُ الْعَزَاءَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ The reason why I'm telling you this is so that you can be proud. That you did the right job. My fathers and my mothers, how proud would we be if my, our son can come to us and tell us, Oh Abuji, I memorized three pages today of the Qur'an. Or I'm going for 40 days today. Or I'm going for four months. Or I'm doing this. But today we have no choice but to lower our heads in the society because we have not trained our youngsters in the right way. In the, in the youth, in the, in the minds of the youth, is that if we get more money, we will be more happy. And if, if we get bigger degrees, we will be more happy. It's like that one guy who was fishing on the shore of the ocean. What was he doing? Fishing. You know, you know how they say, talk at the level of everybody? So there's youngsters here, there's elders here. So that's why we have to talk at the level of everybody. There's one guy who was fishing on the shore of the ocean. He had a fishing rod in the ocean, and he was laying back, chilling, kicking it, you know? Relaxing. Aram se leta wata. We all understand Urdu? Most of us, Aram se leta wata. So one guy comes to him, some smart guy from America comes to him and says to him, What are you doing? He says, I'm catching fish. He says, Why are you catching fish here for? Why don't you go in the middle of the ocean? There's more fish in the middle of the ocean. He says, Pir kya hoga? He says, What does he say? I want you guys to repeat. What does he say? Pir kya hoga? What's going to happen next? He said, hey, if you go in the middle of the ocean, there's more fish. And the amount of time you're spending here, so many hours, less than that, you'll be more efficient. You'll spend less hours, get more fish, and you'll get more money. Phir kya hoga? He says, what's going to happen next? Phir kya hoga? He said, then you'll get this money, and you'll come back, and you will, first you're renting the boat, now you'll buy your own boat. Phir kya hoga? What's going to happen next? He said, then once you buy your own boat, then you go there, now you're not renting anymore, it's your own boat. So now you'll be making money and not giving money to anybody. Phir kya hoga? So then you'll get more money and you come back and you buy another boat. Phir kya hoga? What's gonna happen next? He said, once you buy this other boat, now you can hire people. Phir kya hoga? What's gonna happen next? He said, once you hire people, now instead of using a fishing rod and stuff, you can get, buy a big net, throw it in the ocean, kick it, wait, after a few hours, come back. And you'll get so much more money like that. Phir kya hoga? He said, now when you have two, three boats running in the middle of the ocean daily, and you have all these people working for you, and you have these nets, and you have these fishing sticks, then you will have enough money to buy a land. Phir kya hoga? Once you buy this land, you have enough money to build a house. Phir kya hoga? Once you build this house, you have enough money to buy furniture, bring some nice chandeliers, nice carpet, nice everything, you'll make a beautiful house for yourself. Phir kya hoga? He said, once you have a beautiful house, beautiful furniture, beautiful beds, businesses running, phir aram se leer janna. He is like, beokuf abhi aram se ni leta wa. You telling me all this? I'm chilling right now. Why are you telling me this whole story just to relax? Abhi aram se leta wa. 
Brothers, this is, this is the deception. Mata'ul ghurur. Deception. Do this, do this, do this, and do this, and you'll be happy. No. It's not like that. You know when Abdullah bin Quruz, radiallahu anhu, he came to the Prophet, and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, you know in my heart, I feel like saying a poem today. Prophet said, okay, go ahead and say it. So Rasulullah so called all the people, and he got everyone close to the member. And he said, oh Abdullah, go ahead and say it. So Abdullah bin Quruz stood up, and he said this very nice poem. He says, فَإِنِّي وَأَهْلِي وَالَّذِي قَدَّمَتْ يَدَيَّ كَدَاعٍ إِلَيْهِ صَحْبُهُ ثُمَّ قَائِلِي لِإِخْوَتِهِ إِذْهُمْ ثَلَاثَةُ إِخْوَةٍ أَعِينُوا عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ بِيَ الْيَوْمَ نَازِلِي فِرَاقٌ طَوِيلٌ غَيْرٌ مُتَّثِقٍ بِهِ فَمَاذَا لَدَيْكُمْ فِي الَّذِي هُوَ غَائِلِي فقال امرؤ منهم أنا الصاحب الذي أنا الصاحب الذي قد كنت جدا أحبه وأوثره من بينهم في التفاضل غناني غنائي أني جاهد لك ناصح إذا جد جد الكرب غير مقاتل ولكنني باك عليك ومعول ومثنم بخير عند من هو سائل ومتبع الم ومتبع الماشين أمشي مشيعا وأرجع مقرونا بما هو شاغلي كأن لم يكن بيني وبينك خلة ولا حسن ود مرة في التباذل فذلك أهل المرء ذاك غناؤهم وليس وإن كانوا حراسا بطائر إلي وقال امرؤ منهم أنا الأخ لا ترى أخلك مثلي عند كرب الزلازل لدى القبر تلقاني هنالك قاعدا أجادل عنك القول رجع التجادل وأقعد يوم الوزن على الكفة التي تكون عليها جاهدا في التثاقل فلا تنسني وعلم مكاني فإنني عليك شفيق غير خاذلي فذاك, فذاك حسن المرء ذاك عمالهم يا yeah, my brothers and my elders and my sisters this, this poem he said he said the example of a person who is dying فإني وأهلي والذي قدمت يدي the example of a person who lived his whole life and he did everything he wanted in this life. The example of him after, just before, before dying, is if you gather all of his wealth, and all of his family members, and all of his achievements, and all of his degrees, and all of his success together, they all come into th forms of three brothers. How many brothers? Three brothers. You don't understand Arabic, so understand the English. And I'll try to, I'll try to, I'll try to do tarjuma. Three brothers. So the first brother, he says to the first brother, now he's dying. Brother, dying is not an easy thing. Dying? When your person is dying, the pain the person receives when he's dying. When he's dying, the pain. Rasulullah said, it's like, an, it's like a comb which is made out of knives and which is so hot and it's peeling your skin. That's the pain a person who's dying receives. Allahumma hawin alayya sakarat al maut. Even the Prophet himself made dua. Oh Allah, ease, ease the pain at the time of death. So now when he will be at that pain, and he has no choice, he's gonna look towards his first brother and say, Oh my brother, help me out. The first brother will say, He will say, No. You see, whatever help you want. Take it from me right now. فَإِن تُبْقِ لَا تُبْقِ نَنَّنِي فَاسْتَنْفِ دَنَّنِي وَعَجِّلْ صَلَاحًا قَبْلَ حَتْفٍ مُعَاجِلِي I helped you all your life. What does he say? I helped you all your life. Whenever you needed me, I was there for you. I said, لَبَّيْك. And whenever you wanted to buy something, I said, لَبَّيْك. Whenever you wanted to get something, I said, لَبَّيْك. But today, before you die, you better get rid of me. Because once you die, because of me, your whole family will have wars. So don't waste time. You might die right now. Hurry up and get rid of me now. And the first brother will say nothing to him. Then he will look towards the second brother and he will say, please don't let me down. My first brother already let me down and you're my second last hope. The second brother will say, no, I'm not like this brother. I'm not like this brother. قَدْ كُنْتُ جِدًّا أُحِبُّهُ وَأُوثِرُهُ مِنْ بَيْنِهِمْ فِي التَّفَاضُلِ I am that brother who loves you more than anything. What I will do for you, I won't leave your hand once you die. But what I will do, with, what I'll do for you is I will take, once you pass away, I'll give your body a shower. I will give you a kafan. And I will carry you on my shoulders. And I will take you to the graveyard. And I will place you in the grave. Then I will place the dirt over your body. 
But that's where it stops. When I come back, كَأَلَّمْ يَكُمْ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنِكَ خُلَّةً وَلَا حُسْنُ وُدٍ مَرَّةً فِي التَّبَاذُلِي When I come back and I return home, my life will run like it was running before. And after a little while, I won't even know you left me. After a little while, كَأَلَّمْ يَكُمْ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنِكَ خُلَّةً I won't even know we ever had one night together. I won't even remember that one conversation we had together. My life will be running the way it was running before. So he will say, that's all you can do for me. Then he will look towards the third brother. And the third brother will say to him, أَنَا الْأَخُ لَا تَرَى أَخَلَّكَ مِثْلِي عِنْدَ كَرْبِ الزَّلَازِلِي I'm that brother, I'm such a brother, you have never met me before. Uh, you have never met me before. I will help you out. When they leave you, I will jump in the grave with you. And when, when, the, when, when Munkar and Nakir come to ask you questions, أُجَادِلُ عَنْكَ الْقَوْلَ رَجَعَ التَّجَادُلِي I will answer on your behalf. And Munkar and Nakir will say, No, we're asking him. But I will say, No, you ask me because he took care of me when he was alive. And I'm going to take care of him today when he's dead. And on the day of judgment, when your good and bad deeds will be, will be weighed, I will jump on the scale of good deeds and make your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. And I will not leave your finger until Allah grants you Jannah. So the, Abdullah bin Qura says in the shair, the first brother, فَذَاكَ أَهْلُ الْمَرْءِ ذَاكَ غَنَاؤُهُمْ وَلَيْسَ وَإِنْ كَانُوا حِرَاسًا بِطَائِلِي The first brother who said, you know what? Get rid of me now. Don't wait till you die. That's his wealth. That's his? What is it? I can't hear. What is it? His wealth. And the second brother who said, we'll take you inside the grave, with, we'll take you and put you in the grave, and come back and talk about you a little bit, but we'll forget about you after you leave. That brother is his? Family. And the third brother is those weak a'mal that we were doing when we were praying salat. You know, one person came to me, and he says, you know, Sheikh, I, can't, I don't have khushu and khudu in my salat. Then I remember what my teacher says. My teacher once told me that one person came to him and said, yeah, Sheikh, I have a problem in my salat. He said, what's the problem? He said, every time I say, Allahu Akbar, boom, I start thinking about my wife. So my teacher said, don't worry, at least you're thinking about your wife. Go ahead. <laughs> you're not thinking about any other woman. <laughs> the majority of the people are thinking about other women. So go continue thinking about your wife. <laughs> so now, Allahu Akbar. And every, these weak amal, these weak amal are the ones that's going to save us in that day. So my dear respected brothers, we are all smart people. We are all intelligent people. We will invest in that place where we think there will be profit. Will any of us invest in a place where we think there will be no profit? No. Will any youngster sitting here start a career in college where there's no future for? No. Because there's no profit and there's no success rate. Similarly, it is, it's... The proof is in the pudding. The success rate in the investment that we should be making is for akhirat. Is for akhirat. And of course we can attain dunya. Man talab al-halal isti'afafan anil mas'ala wa ta'affufan ala jari wa sa'yan ala ahli laqi Allah ta'ala yawm al-qiyama wa wajhu kal-qamri layt al-badri That person who works 9 to 5 and is attaining dunya Attaining dunya, wealth. But his intention, first of all, he's attaining halal. And his intention is, through this halal money, I will feed my family. His intention is, through this halal money, I will help the poor. Rasulullah says, on the day of judgment, he will meet Allah, and his face will be light, will have so much light on it, like the amount of radiance the 14th moon has. وَمَنْ طَلَبَ halal. And that person who is doing a halal job, halal, not the Ronald McDonald job, huh? halal job, huh? doing a halal job. And, but, muraiyan, mukathiran, mufakhiran. He's working for halal, but the reason why he's earning money is to show off. And the reason why he's earning money is to compete. And the reason why he's earning money is to tell people, I have more money than you. لَقِيَ Allah Ta'ala يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ غَضْبَانِ He will meet Allah on the Day of Judgment and Allah will be angry with him. My dear respected brothers, our elders in the past, Imam Malik Rahimahullah, he did hajj 40 times. And you know what he said? He said, in my 40 hajj, 
I never once asked Allah for dunya. And today all of our duas for dunya. Oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, please help me. Good job. Get me. I want this. I want this. Once Abdul Malik bin Warwan, he came inside the Kaaba. And he saw Salim, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. He came inside the Kaharab and he saw Salim ibn Abdullah sitting there. And he says to Salim, Abdul, Salim ibn Abdullah, Abika Haja, do you need anything? I'm the king and you're very poor. Do you need anything? You know what he says? Inni astahi an ajlis fi baytillah an asal ghayr Allah. I, am, I, am, I, feel, I feel very bad and I will feel very embarrassed that sitting in front of Allah in his house, I ask anyone other than Allah. So why are you asking me now? I'm not going to tell you. So this king goes and he stands outside the door of the haram. And he waits for Salim ibn Abdullah. He grabs his shoes and it's sunnah to hold the shoes in the left hand. He grabs it and he's walking outside the door. And once he reaches the exit, this king had also good intention. So he says to him, Salim, Alan, Abika Haja. Now you're outside. Now you're it's outside. Now do you need anything? So now Salim Abdullah says, Amin Hawaij Dunya, Amin Hawaij al Akhirah. Should I ask you something that I need among the dunyawi things? Or should I ask you for, for something that I will need in akhirat? Should I ask you something that I will need now in dunya? Or should I ask you something that I will need in akhirat? So the Hisham says, of course, for dunya, I can help you in akhirat. Of course, for dunya. You know what he said? Inni lam as'al abadan man yamlikuha fakayfa as'al wahadan man la yamlikuha. He said, I never in my life asked that being who owns the whole dunya. How can I ask that person who owns nothing, even he doesn't own his life? I never asked that being who owns the entire dunya for dunya. How should I ask that person who owns nothing of this dunya? So my dear respected brothers and elders and youngsters, our pride and our competition and our, our life should be for akhirat. Our life should be, how can my akhirat get better? And if the whole family, if the whole family today, we have wife, today the topic is just about the trials of wealth. But you know the trials of wealth, they go very, very far. You know, before our parents will tell you, when we had less money, life was much easier. Some older people sitting here? Yes or no? Huh? Young people. <laughs> yeah. When we had less money, our life was much more easier. When we got more, now the wife is asking for more. Now the wife? is asking for more things. They say, what do you call a man who apologizes? What do you call a man who apologizes when he's wrong? Humble? What do you call him? What do you call a man who apologizes when he's not sure if he's right or wrong? He's not sure, but he still apologizes. Kind? What do you call a man who apologizes and definitely he knows he's innocent? Definitely! But he still apologizes. A husband. Definitely. He knows he's innocent, but I'm sorry, Tika, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So now, my dear respected brothers, this is, a, this is, if all of us get together, the husband, the wife, the children, the family, and we put our head together, and today we decide, today we decide, like the Sahaba decided, today we decide, that if I get more of dunya, it doesn't mean anything. But if I get more of akhirah, that's what means everything. Hazrat Umar was sitting there and his son brought salan. What did he bring? Salan. And this salan had shorba, you know, curry, and it had a piece of meat. You know, if we go to Dawat today, we have to, you know, cook five, six different dishes. And we ask, why are you cooking these five, six different dishes? We went to that guy's house, he had five dishes too. So we have to cook five, six dishes today. Okay? This is what, brother, this is reality. This is harsh reality. Hazrat Umar. Who is that person? In al malaika la yatakallam wa ala lisani Umar. Who is that person that malaika tried to talk like Umar? Who is that person who Rasulullah said, "Oh Umar, ma fil ma fil samai malakun illa wa huwa yuqin Umar, wa la fil ardi shaytanun illa wa huwa yafur min Umar." There is no angel in the sky who does not respect Umar, and there is no shaytan on earth who does not run away from Umar. That Umar. When he was when the salon was placed in front of him, you know what he said? Ta'amain fi qadhin wahidin. Ta'amain fi qadhin wahidin. Oh my son, what has happened to you? 
Are we eating two different food in one dish? One dish is a shorba and one dish is a meat. Are we eating two different foods in one dish? I will never eat this. I will never eat this. Sitting here today, we raise our hand. Do we from our heart think and believe that Hazrat Umar was a guaranteed successful person? Yes or no? He, did, he, was, he wouldn't even eat that. Once a person came and sat in front of him, a, a, a wali of a city, and he said, eat. He said, eat food. So now that person is eating food and he's like a, one of us, like a desi, you know, looking for ghost. You know, looking for meat. Now he finds meat. Oh, I found it. Now he picks it up and he puts it in his mouth to eat. Now he's eating it. He's chewing it, but it's, you know, charbi. It's fat. So he takes it out and he puts it in the sarkhan. Now he's looking for another piece of meat. Oh, he finds one more floating around. Who grabs it and he puts it in his mouth. And again, it's fat. And then, now he's eating all that fat. He feels thirsty. So then he grabs the, the liquid that was sitting next, next to him in a little bowl. He picks it up and he drinks it. Right when he drinks it, he spits it out. So Hazrat Umar says, Ma a'ajabaka ta'ami wa sharabi. Huh? You didn't like my food and you didn't like my drink. huh? It doesn't seem like you liked it. He said, no dog. <laughs> Of course, I didn't like your food. What is this? Is this food? Hazrat Umar says, Hazrat Umar says, I slaughter a camel every single day. And I distribute all the meat, any piece of meat in the camel that is edible. I distribute all that meat among the fuqara and the poor people of Medina and the muhajirin of Medina. And I keep for myself that portion of the camel that nobody can eat. That is not edible by anybody. So I eat that and my family eats this. But since this fat, it has so much acid that it can burn your stomach. So when I eat this fat and this charbi, what I do is I have this vinegar next to it. So when I drink the vinegar on top of it, the acidic reaction of the fat goes away. Brothers, these people were successful. These people were? successful they were happy they were content they lived this they lived in this world smiling and they died smiling because they knew in their heart that Allah is waiting for them and today we're not like that so today we're sitting here today this this trial of wealth this is what it's all about it's that one deception of that one fisherman that one deception of that one fisherman you're gonna go down there that's it so we all make intention today that we will make an effort. We will make an effort, a joint family effort. Not just an effort by myself. We will get our whole family on the same page. And now mothers and fathers, instead of making dua for dunya, we things for our children, we make dua for things of akhirat. Allah will give dunya. That person who said, Anna rabbukum al-a'la fir'aun. That person who said, I am the, I'm the rub of everybody. If Allah gave him food on his dastarkhan, what do we think? That kid who is saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen will not get food? Allah will feed him. Allah will take care of him. Allah will make him content. And Allah will make him happy. And because of him, his whole family will be blessed. May Allah make it easy for us to decide today that all of us mothers and fathers, I plead to you and I beg you, we make our children like the Sahaba, like the glory old days. And we make our children like that. We make dua for them. A mother's dua is accepted by Allah. But today mothers are making dua for the wrong thing. Parents' du'as are accepted by Allah. But parents are making du'a for the wrong thing. We go in sajda. You know, in my neighborhood, we had this one mother and father who used to make their children sleep by this lullaby. By this lullaby. Dur dur jayenge, kal ko philayenge, abbu bhi jayenge, ammi bhi jayegi. Then they said, Muhammad, I'm not going to say the names of those boys because maybe you'll find out who they are. Muhammad bhi jayega, Ahmad bhi jayega. Uthman bhi jayega, sardi ho to jayenge, garmi ho to jayenge, paise ho to jayenge, paise na ho to jayenge, dur dur jayenge, kalme ko philayenge. Brothers, mother, father, when they say this, I see on the authority of Quran Hadith, if we put our kids to sleep by saying this, we will see with our own eyes, our children will be going to the four corners of the world, spreading the kalima. But we never said it because it's not in our heart. It's not in our heart. So today we start saying it. And if we want to know it, I'll write it down for you. We say it from our heart. 
And we sing it to our children. Our little baby who's falling asleep, we sing it to them. Today we look at a baby, ha, inshallah, inshallah, both but a doctor banega. Huh? No, what is doctor? Inshallah, doctor will banega. Lekin da'i banega. He's gonna be a person who's gonna make Allah happy. And this is contentment. And if he has wealth, he'll be happy. And if he doesn't have wealth, he'll still be happy. All of us ready for this, inshallah. We make a collective effort. Whatever effort is being made in our localities, we join that effort and we put our kids in that effort and we be proud parents and all of, our, all of the kids today, we also make our parents proud. Because parents, when they become proud, they make dua for us. Usama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'anhu, and at the time of Hazrat Uthman bin Affan, he ran outside to his garden of Kujur. And he got a bunch of dates and he put it in a little, put it in a little, you know, cloth and he covered it up and he was bringing it back. So then the people that saw him doing this, they said, Oh, Osama, ma hamalaka ala hadha wa qad arafta anna nakhr qad balagat alfa dinarin. Oh, Osama, why are you taking the dates out right now? You should wait because now the dates prices have not quadrupled, 10 times more now. Before they were 100 dinar, now they're a thousand dinar. You should have just saved them and sold them and got 10 times the profit. Why are you taking the dates out right now? For the youth, open your ears. You know what he said? He said, my mother wanted dates right now. To give her what she wants, when she wants, is better than this whole world and whatever it contains. Jazakumullah khairan mukti abdur rahman may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten us with the words that you have said just a small reminder to the brothers and sisters downstairs please tone it down there were complaints from the sister side so for the young sisters please just tone it down a little bit inshallah we're trying to uh, trying to lay, uh, pay attention to our speakers alhamdulillah they are very priceless the advice that they are giving us <coughs> our next speaker Sheikh Khalilullah Qadri you have uh, witnessed him before Alhamdulillah, he is a senior classmate to me. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him. He graduated from uh, Madrasa Arabiya uh, Islamiya in Azadville in 20, uh, 2009. And obviously over there he studied philosophy, Middle Eastern studies, history, and he has the ijazah to narrate the Siha Sitta. And from there on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him. <clears throat> I have been privileged actually to be uh, performing the door with him in Buffalo, Darul Ulum al Madaniya, back in 2003. So right now, at this current moment, he is actually serving the greater community of uh, community of Greater Harrisburg, and he's uh, the Imam and the director of the Islamic Society of uh, Harrisburg. So he's going to have a presentation, the the tests and the trials of the youth, and inshallah, we'd like to call upon Sheikh Khalilullah Qadri. Uh, just as a reminder, our Salatul Asr will commence at 6:30 p.m. Inshallah. So bear with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're just waiting for it to come up. So inshallah, just bear with me. There you go. 
ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القران المجيد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا نبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الاموال والانفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين اذا اصابتهم مصيبه قالوا انا لله وانا اليه راجعون صدق الله العظيم Dear respected brothers, elders, honorable ulama kiram and respected sisters and mothers and the ayat that I have recited that is here before you is the ayah from Surah Baqarah. Now let us try to analyze this whole these two verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Wala nablu wannakum. Verily, we will surely test you. We will test you. Now, this is general. Everyone will be tested. No matter who you are. In a different verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Alif lam mim. Ahasib an nasu an yutraku an yakulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ You have called yourself a Muslim. You have labeled yourself as a believer. You have uttered the kalima, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ مُحَمَّدُ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهُ And do you think we will leave you like that and we will not test you? You are a believer. Prove it. You are a Muslim. Prove it. You have recited the kalima. Did the kalima go into your heart or is it, is it just on your lips? If it went in your heart, prove it. And be ready for the test because we will test you. Just like the people who came prior to you. The nations that came before you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them as well. Some of them passed with high marks. And others failed miserably. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is going to test everyone. Somewhere in your life, you will be tested. In the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that we will test you and He brings up five points. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He brings five points. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ With some fraction of fear, the fear will be within you when you feel this fear and this condition in you. Then know that this is a test from us. Inshallah, I will elaborate on all of the points one by one. So, what is this fear? See, people they fear different things. People fear other humans, animals. People fear different things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something which will be appropriate for this occasion. I have made it in a point form. But there are more points than this. So people are afraid of others. People are afraid of their society. If I, as a Muslim, tell them, open up to them, if the society finds out my religion, if they find out my background, how would they react? 
So identity crisis. Many a times people in this country, obviously majority rules, right? Back home, everyone is a Muslim. Everything is going smooth. Over here, we're in the minority. And generally when you're in the minority, then you are weak. And you do not want to link yourself with the weak people. And then we all know what's happening around the news. You listen to news, and the first topic that comes up is Islam. So, identity crisis. But ask yourself, who are you? Who are you? Are you Muhammad? Are you Ahmad? Are you Fatima? Are you Aisha? Or are you someone else? Or you don't know who you are. You're confused. Huh? We probably heard this many a time. American born confused A, B, C, D, Desis. Huh? Why? Because we are in a society where people look at us as a weak, weak people. People look at us that these people are in the minority. And they are in the majority. And then from day one, the society around us is making such an effort to control us, to govern over us. A, a baby who's born, a small child, he grows up. First thing he does, he goes to school when he's five years old. Then people are there, they are putting ideas in his head. And then he grows more and he is in that environment of school. And again, he is in the minority. And just say if my friends have to find out that I am a Muslim, how would they react? And as life goes on, these children, they start growing. And, and this fear within them, the fear that they have of their identity, keeps on growing and growing. And then it makes them ambiguous and confused. That the Islam that I'm really practicing, is that really true? Everything that Rasulullah said, is it really true? Why? Because from the beginning, we are a little confused about our own identity. We don't even know who we are. We had that fear within us, which we did not face. And that fear kept on growing within us. You see this many a times. In the masajid when you go, people enter the masjid, roll their pants up, take out their topi which was in their pocket from last prayer, and they put it on, and Allahu Akbar, they are praying salah. And we all know, I mean, I don't know if you heard about, about the convertible scarfs. The convertible scarf, it's, it's like in the neck, right when you come for namaz, it goes on. And after salah, you don't even have to put it back, it goes off by itself. Why? We don't want people to know we are Muslims. That fear is within us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us an example of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And look at the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim, inna Ibrahim kana ummatan qanitan lillahi hanifa. He was a one man nation. His odds, everyone in his nation was against him. Everyone in his nation was against him. And they were putting him in the fire. And what happened? Qala Ibrahim, hina ulqiya fil nar. When he was being put into the fire, he said, no one is with me. Hasbi Allah, wa ni'ma al-wakeel, wa ni'ma al-mawla, wa ni'ma al-nasir. Allah is with me. Allah is with me. I do not need to fear anyone. So he faced that fear that he had within. And see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped him. He didn't tell the angel who was in charge of the fire that go see that fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly commanded the, the fire. Qulna ya narukuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. O fire! Allah is speaking to the fire directly that you become the means of coolness for Ibrahim. 
So this is coming back to the point. This is the fear that is within us. If we experience this feeling, that know that this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a test from Allah. Are you going to pass this test or are you going to fail this test? It is a promise from Allah. We will surely test you somewhere in your life. Maybe once, maybe twice, maybe more than that. When at the time of the t- trench, the time of the trench, the Sahaba, they got together. Again, they were minority. They were known to be weak. The battle of Badr happened. The Sahaba, they seen 3,000 to 5,000 angels coming to their help. One Sahabi, he says, I was going in the battle and I had nothing. We were 313 fighting against a thousand. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, let's go. So I said, okay, let's go. I had a branch in my hand. I was walking and I seen a branch, I picked it up. I said, I'm going to fight with this branch. And he says, when I got to the battlefield, I picked up that branch. And before I even whacked him, I seen that he was the kafir, he was laying down dead. These people saw the angels with their eyes coming down to help them. In the battle of Uhud, after that the battle of trench happened. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there as well. إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ وَبَلَغَتِ الْخُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ وَتَذُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الزُّنُونَ هُنَالِكَ الْمُبْتَلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, we tested the believers. We tested the believers and these believers were shaken. Zalzala, وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا Why? All the forces got united. They were coming to crush the Muslims. Salman Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Ya Rasulullah, in Persia, when we would meet a situation like this, we would dig trenches around. So why don't we implement the idea over here? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, very nice idea. They started digging the trench. The Munafiq, they said, you guys are going to be crumbled today. All the forces are coming and they're going to crush you. The Sahaba along with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started digging. They came across a big, big rock which they couldn't break. So they started digging these trenches around Madinatul Munawwara. And these people had to face hunger. They weren't really well off in the initial stage. So the Sahabi, he came running to Rasulullah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, it's too much now. He lifted up his shirt. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have to tie a stone to my belly. This is how hungry I am. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was the mercy for the humanity, he picked up his shirt and he said, Ya, oh my Sahabi, you have one stone, I have two. He had two stones. So one is the fear, and then another hunger. Now Salman Farsi radiallahu ta'ala who comes to Rasulullah, he said, Ya Rasulullah, there's a big rock, we are trying to hit it. It's not moving from its way. It's not moving out from our, our way, so we cannot break it. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, I'm coming. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he got there. He picked up the axe with his own Mubarak hands. And he said, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا And he hit that rock. And a light emerged from that rock which lit the whole of Madinah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, فُتِحَتِ الْكَيْسَ Roman Empire has been conquered. Then he said, he picked the axe up again. For the second time he's about to hit, he says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا لَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِ He hits it for the second time. Again, a light emerges. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, فُتِحَتِ الْكِسْرَى The Persian Empire has been conquered. For the third time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he picks up the axe. 
He finishes off the ayah. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا لَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَنِيمُ He hits that rock. The rock breaks. A light emerges again. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, I can see the palaces of Yemen in the hands of the Muslims. Now the munafiq, in the beginning they were, they were putting the fear in the hearts of these believers. And then they also seen the hunger that these people were going through. And then they heard the, 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 the statements from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was too funny for them. They said, these people have been gone mad. Billah. And they started laughing and laughing and laughing. To an extent that they couldn't stand. They were on the floor. They fell on the floor laughing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard their laugh. Jibreel alayhi salam came rushing down with the verses. قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِ الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِنْ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ إِنَّكَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell these munafiqs, Allah is the one who is the king of all the kings. He is the one who gives kingdom to whoever he wishes. Snatches away kingdom from whoever he wishes. Honors whoever he wishes. Disgraces whoever he wishes. In his hand belongs all power. Right there, the munafiqs, the hypocrites. They couldn't speak no more. They, they, be, they, they were full with awe. So these sahaba, imagine people laughing at you. These sahaba, they've seen all of this. They were shaken. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them by this verse. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a wind which made all the forces go back. So this fear that we have within us, when we feel this fear, when, 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 we, when we experience this fear, we should know that this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My time is short, so inshallah I'm going to go quickly. The next is hunger. We spoke a little bit about hunger. The, the picture is a little funny, but it's okay. <laughs> hunger. Sometimes there is food, no money. Sometimes you have money, no food. Sometimes you have money and you have food, but you have the sickness which prevents you from taking that food. And sometimes you have everything, but it's haram, what can you do? When you come across these situations, don't say, oh Allah, why this time? Believe me, it's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you. You said you are a Muslim, prove it. You said you are a believer, prove it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He won't make us tie stones to our belly. That, that was the time of the Sahaba. I don't even think anyone recalls the night going to sleep hungry, let alone tying a stone. Sometimes the food is not there, sometimes it's a little burnt. This is also a test. Sometimes it's a little delayed. This is also a test. The third item Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions is loss of wealth. Every day is not addition. You go to school, the teacher teaches you addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And once you pass all of that, then the teacher says, okay, you know your mathematics. So every day is not addition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, when we give this insan a little bit and we take it away, when you give it to him, he gets so happy that he forgets us. He doesn't even know it's a test. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you so much, but it's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That doesn't mean you forget Him. Sometimes you have a lot and you go back to zero. You have a lot, you go back to zero. That doesn't mean now you start, you become, you, you become hopeless. So this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take, take it as a test. In one hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that, إِنَّ عِذَمَ الْجَزَاءِ مَا عِذَمِ الْبَلَاءِ The harder the test and the trial is, the greater the reward is. Listen, 
the higher, the more difficult the trial is, the greater and the more reward you get. When Allah loves a nation, He puts them in a trial. Now it's upon you how you react to that trial. You take it as a trial and you are patient and you know it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't say those things which you are not supposed to utter. فَمَنْ رَضِيَ فَلَهُ الرِّضَى You are happy with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is also happy with you. But you take that trial as a disaster and a calamity then that calamity will be a means of Allah's anger. So that trial can be the means of Allah's, Allah's happiness. And at the same time, that trial can be the means of Allah's anger. The fourth item Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that He will test you with is your lives. Sometimes you have the near and dear ones they leave. Sometimes the separation hurts. Imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all together he had six children. Five of them left this world before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the last one, Ibrahim radiallahu ta'ala who was leaving this world, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the words that were on his tongue, our eyes shed tears. Our heart feels that separation, the grief of separation. But oh Ibrahim, we will only utter those words which will make Allah happy. So Allah will test you. And the last one is fruits. Allah will test you with fruits. What does this mean? Fruits. Huh? Mangoes. Mango season is up. Allah will take those mangoes. No, no. The weather. The weather, sometimes it will suit you. Other times, it will not suit you. Sometimes, you, you, you plan for a nice day of barbecue and the, weather, and the, and the clouds come and it starts raining. When this situation, when you experience this situation, this is also a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somewhere down your life, you will be tested. These are just five Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, but there are more to this. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He concludes the ayah by saying, وَبَشِّرِ sabirin." What's the solution to your problems? You have to face the problem. You cannot turn away from the problem and let the problem go increase more and more. You will face that problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu sta'inu bis sabri was salah. Two things Allah mentions over here. Allah is the one who gives you the problem. Allah says, you be patient right now. And you do your a'mal, your salah. Subhanallah, look at the mercy of Allah. He gives you that problem. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. He comes on your side. Verily Allah is the, with the ones who are patient. He gives you that problem. He comes on your side. But what do you have to do to make Allah on your side? Two things. Sabr and salah. And the second point which is mentioned in the, within, this is all the same ruku. The second point that is mentioned in this ruku is الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبًا When a difficulty, when a difficulty comes your way, then قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We came, we are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our return. We, we are from Allah and to Allah is our return. Meaning now in this particular situation, you be patient. And to Allah is your return, so make an effort to that return. 
make an effort to that return. You know, many of the students will understand this example better. That you want to become a doctor, you do not become a doctor overnight. It takes time. And in that long period of time, sometimes eight years, ten years, then you have different tests that come along. So when those tests come along, that doesn't mean you take a U-turn and you say, this is not for me. Assalamu alaikum. No. You face those tests. You do those tests. And if you pass with higher marks, you go on the next level. A person, he wants to become a lawyer. He will also get these tests. Any, any, any form of education, you will get these tests. This is just an example. But when those tests become very hard, then you start looking towards the degree that you are going to get. The harder the test is, the bigger the degree is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test us, to give us a PhD. Tomorrow when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have more, you went through more trials, then you should know Allah is about to give you a PhD on the day of Qiyamah. We all know when a, when a student he graduates, how happy is he? He calls all his friends and everyone. Today is my graduation, you better be there. And those who don't be there, who, who are not there, I'm not your friend no more. So we call everyone for our graduation and the day and when we get our graduation, when we get our degrees and everything, we go around showing everyone. Brothers, everyone will have a graduation day. And that graduation day is tomorrow when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one he will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His book of deeds were given in his right hand. Now he's going to go around telling everyone, Look, I have passed. I have passed. I have passed those tests and trials that came in my life. Today I have been rewarded for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ لِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Those people who are patient, those people who are patient in the time of trials, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah, He will give them a blank check. A blank check. You know, you have a property. You find out the value of that property. And the higher the value is, the happier we get. It's a million, mashallah. Two million, mashallah. And then just say if another person, he has to come and he, has, he says, I'll buy this from you, I'll give you a blank check, you write how much you want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, these trials are going to come your way. You cannot avoid them. You face them with sabr and salah. On the day of qiyamah, take the blank check from me. You write down how much you want. So the ball is in our hands. It's upon you. What do you want to be? Do you want to be a loser on the day of Qiyamah? Do you want to fail miserably on the day of Qiyamah? Or do you want to pass with high marks? If you do, then these are the points. Work towards Akhirat. Work towards the day when you will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will see that PhD degree given to you. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the correct understanding. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when He tests us, we don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, test me, test me. No. We are weak. If we come across any test, then we do patient. We, we, we practice our patience. Jazakumullah khairan shaykh khaliullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the words of wisdom that you have given us. Subhanallah, he reminded us that most of us are worried about the recession of the economy and the depression. But none of us are worried about the recession of our a'mal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you said, inna ma sabiruna ajrahum bi hisab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the blank check on the day of judgment. I want to cash it. I hope it doesn't bounce. With that, alhamdulillah, you guys have your break. You guys can go and chillax. And relax and have your tea, inshallah. Salatul Asr will be at 6.15 specifically. 
So uh, please do not be late because we have a very important program at the end, inshallah, uh, after Salat al Asr. 6.15 is your Asr, you should go on and go bounce around and come back at 6.15, inshallah. <coughs> Just as a small reminder, the brother with the Toyota Corolla and the Honda Pilot blocking the gateway after Asr, we have to use that to exit. So inshallah, please be here for Salah. So immediately after Salah, we can uh, uh, take the car out.